right, real quick. Um, I am Skylar with Lean Frontiers. You will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. Lou, Mike, and Oscar are here today. Also, just real quick, we were just talking about this, but they will also be joining us at the TWI and Cotta Summit coming up in April. So with that, Oscar, you do have several people still logging in, but if you want to go ahead and take over, you're good to go. Thanks, Skylar. And uh, as I always say, Skylar, thanks for all your organization of these events. People just log on and away we go, but I know there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. So thanks again. So with this webinar, half an hour, we're joined by Mike Caston, who's a construction consultant, and Dr. Lou Flashpolar, who uh, is a doctor. I won't spend a lot of time introducing a lot of you all have probably met them through summits or through uh, webinars that both of them have done. But uh, don't panic. Not many of us are builders or doctors. I understand that. But we're not discussing building or medicine as such. What we will be discussing, we encourage you to look for the principles behind that. And uh, Mike and Lou have been asked to make sure we refer to those principles and use examples from the workplace related to those principles. So I'm just going to share my screen. And to start with, you'll probably see the notes page, but uh, just allow me. Um, to alter. So can everyone now see the presentation? No. Not, not yet, Oscar. You had no, shared no. it. It went away. Okay, it gave me a message to say, so share. Have I shared screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. But it's, it's got the whole presentation plus your background. Yep. There we go. Okay. Now, now you got how's that? There, that. There Perfect. we go. Perfect. We're in right business. On. So what I, want to, uh, what I want you to do, please, uh, audience, is think about something very specific in your organization at the operator level that has been giving you grief for some time. Uh, production or a service delivery issue, it doesn't matter. So think about that, and I want you to write it down. So I'm going to give you another 30 seconds. Think about something very specific in your organization. at the operator level that has been giving you grief for some time, production, delivery, or service, and write the issue down. All right. And then we're going to come back to that. So please don't lose what you wrote down. So, Mike, making do the overlooked waste. Can you introduce that concept, please, based on the notes on the slide? And um, and I know you've got some pretty strong thoughts around this. Oh, yes, I'd be happy to. A, a friend of mine, a, a, a guy from Denmark by the name of Lori Koskela, um, who has been involved with the lean movement within construction. And, and, and But that is just that's what he does. It doesn't mean that it's. Uh, limited to construction, but Laurie wrote a paper some time back that was peer reviewed by people all over the world about making do as not only a waste, but a major cause of waste. Um, and he was actually, as he started the paper, or as he was writing the paper, he, he writes in the paper that he was actually surprised that in our business, we have to make certain that we have the things that craftsmen need before they go start the work, but most of the time we don't have, we don't get everything they need, or they get started and can't finish, but they continue trying to keep working, even though they don't have all the inputs. Um, it it has been circulated among a bunch of our superintendents and foremen, and they all nod their heads, saying exactly we've been making do for a long, long time. One thing I'd like to add is that if you contrast making do with the the, the in, in the United States, the there is a group in the in the Navy called the Seabees, and these are civil engineers that build things in advance of Army or Marine or Air Force people coming in. And the motto of the Seabees is "Can do," 
And one of the things that often happens is you get can do and making do going on all at the same time. And before long, people are taking pride in the fact that they can do, even though they're making do. And it is, it becomes so insidious that oftentimes we just take it for that's the way the work is. So, Mike, just define making do. I know it's written on the screen there, but just define what we mean by making do. Making, well, I, I think one of the, the better examples is a good friend of mine said one time, in the absence of a hammer, everything, anything will work. Um, it, it is when we send crews or when, when I mean, in, in whatever setting it is, if there's production to do or service to provide, where people are expected and sent into situations where they are expected to produce but have not received all of the things necessary, that is the information, the tools, the materials, whatever those happen to be, they are missing inputs that, that constrain them from being able to do what they're being asked to do. And they in turn, and I see this all the time, they in turn, get things done virtually in spite of the organization they work for because they have learned how to make do. Yeah, I love that last bit you said. I think that's the key. They learn to get things done in spite of the situation. I think that Correct. puts it in, uh, I think that illustrates it beautifully. They learn to get things done in spite of. Um, so the way, so what we're looking to do is circum, circumvent that that mentality almost of of get things done in spite of. That's Would right. That be a fair comment, Mike. Yes, yes, and yeah. and ironically, when when engineer Ono and Shigeo Shingo came up with their seven wastes, one of the things that I think had they read this paper prior to that, they would have realized that most of those seven wastes come from making do or result yeah, from right. making do. That's right, exactly. It's like the mother of all. It's the parent. It's almost like a parent waste. Would, would that be a, a reasonable description? Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 When, when it's present, the child wastes, being the seven or eight wastes that we're familiar with and hear a lot about, tend to spin off that, that big one of making do. Right. That, thanks for that overview. So before we go too far on this next slide Lou over to you you tell us we, we at the last summit in Jekyll Island we had dinner with you and Mike and Pat Geary and uh, Raghavan Ventricam from Normac and there was a conversation at that dinner that you've um, reminded a number of a number of us of several times can you just uh, give us a quick overview of that conversation please yeah so Oscar as you recall you may not recall me but over the over time, I've heard from you repeatedly echoed what an incredible organization story construction is. Um, just, you, know, you, you beam as you talk about them, and I think you always are leaning in fully as you're going to work with them. So you Absolutely. had just very graciously um, put together this dinner with Michael Kasten and Pat Gary, and as you mentioned, our, our friend um, Raghavan Ventricum. And so I think I speak for Raghavan that for me, it, it was the equivalent of wanting to learn golf and having Tiger Wood give me tips on having uh, on this. So because, you know, looking at Mike and Pat have been at this combined, I bet, for at least six, de six decades and fully leaning in and attempting to learn. And so they were sharing some of the major things that had made huge, huge differences. And so as the, the dinner evolved, Mike, at one point you brought up how Oscar, how there was really good work being done at Story, but it was when Oscar had introduced, and at the, that time we were using, you were using the term poster, the red poster, green poster, that things really started to click. And um, the conversation kind of drifted a little bit from that, but you pulled it back. And, you, and in retrospect, so you pulled it back, said it again, and I don't know if you remember it, but in my brain, 
the way I look at it, Mike, you didn't poke me in the head and say, listen, dummy, I'm trying to tell you something here. But ultimately, I think that's what you were doing, saying, listen, this is important, kind of shaking and saying, this made it, this is really important, take this seriously. Of how much of a difference Pat having introduced, I'm sorry, Oscar having introduced the red poster, green poster in the story and how much that really accelerated story as an organization. So it, it finally got through to my brain. And later that evening, Oscar had, um, you sent those, the red poster, green poster to me and that along with a couple other things that Pat and, um, and Michael had shared, had me kind of completely revamped the talk um, I was doing for the next day. So the point was, at least the point I took from it was that this was a huge, huge thing within story and within your journey overall. Thanks for re re reminding us of that. So let's have a look at what we were talking about. So the red poster is listed, is shown there on the left. If you don't have a clear expectation of what good or normal looks like, then your definition of abnormal or not good is subjective and varies depending on who, what, and when things are being looked at. And that po that came, I identified that from um, Mark Rosenthal's website just after a trip to Japan in 2019. It was pretty timely that I saw it. So can you give us, Lou, a red poster example in your workspace? Yeah, so as we, having, having this skill now i once we once that um summit was over and i came back we one of our huddles is every thursday and this thursday in this particular huddle the team was talking about our in baskets and the team had made a, a decision at one point that if any individual so the in baskets in a our electronic medical records are things like telephone calls, my chart, patient messages, prescription refills, labs that need to be reviewed. And the team had collectively made the decision that if any of us are getting overwhelmed with our in baskets, we can turn to the other team members and ask for help. And the, alternatively, we can view each other's in baskets and see when somebody's in basket seems to be overflowing so we can go and ask them for help. And we had made this decision, but it hadn't done, done, done anything. Nothing was occurring. So bringing this back, the way I introduced it to the team was I had, I made copies of these, handed them out to everybody. I handed out the red card and had one of the team members read if you don't have a vision of what good normal looks like, then your definition of not good, abnormal is subjective and varies depending on who, what, and when things are being looked at. And I asked the team, so I asked one of the team members to read just as I just did. And then I asked, that was um, Alyssa. And I said, Alyssa, what's that mean to you? And I think part of the power of it is, is that not only Alyssa, but the whole team got it. They understood it. And Mike, I don't know if you remember, Mike, when you and she in that dinner, you in five different ways that we've been attempting to talk about standardized work. And you had five different ways of saying the same thing. What this did, I think, made it digestible for your teams, your team members. They got it. And my team members got it. They saw it right away. And the question was, they knew that what we were doing with the in-basket was here. And just quickly, Lou, what were the symptoms of the red poster? So as a consequence of a red, po red card situation, what were the symptoms you were seeing in the workplace? What was the, yeah, what were the symptoms? So the team, the team knows that when somebody's overwhelmed, that's a problem. The team says, okay, then if, if we're overwhelmed, we're gonna raise our hand and say, I'm overwhelmed. But nobody was, over, 
raising their hand. So uh, okay. we put this kind of attempted experiment in place and it just fell flat. Okay. So just hold there. I'm just going to now illustrate the, um, the, the, the opposite, if you like. So red card is that. Green card is the, the 180 degrees around. If you do have a clear expectation of what normal looks like, then your definition of abnormal is objective and the same no matter who, what, when things are being looked at. So in terms of green card, I just took Mark Rosenthal's words in the red card and reversed them, if you like. Red card's negative, green card's positive. Now, how do you bridge that gap? How do we bridge that gap is through something that's absolutely fundamental in standardization and according to a CO Cato, the first step and in standardization, that is and this before training or anything else. And this is the development of work standards where the primary function of a work standard is to define normal, where normal is the predetermined acceptable standard. The primary function of a work standard is to define normal, where normal is the predetermined acceptable standard. Let me just illustrate that very quickly, then I'm going to go back to Lou. So if you were teaching someone how to do an arc weld, the first thing you would do before writing a training script or a procedure or anything like that is define what good looks like in the actual weld itself. So what are the elements and what are the quality point descriptions or what are the attributes that allows someone to say that's a good weld or that's not. Because if we don't have that, we're in red poster zone. If we define what's good and what's, if we define what's good, then we're in green poster zone. Once we've done that, then we can write a pattern or a procedure or a recipe, if you like, for teaching someone how to do the good weld. So Lou, go, like going back to, how did you transition in from red poster to green poster? How did you, in, in your work, your, uh, the people involved in this issue, how did they transition from red to green poster in your, your example? So that Thursday as it evolved, so they read the red card and then the next handout was the green, the green card. And again, I asked, one of the team members to read it. So if you do have a clear expectation of what normal looks like, then your definition of abnormal is objective and the same, no matter who, what, and when things are being looked at. So as we're looking at our in baskets, the question was, where are we on this? And again, I think the power of this is that the team gets it. If we talk about work standards, they may not, not, not know what that means. If you talk about standards in general, they may not know it or be able to absorb it. But they were able to digest this very, very quickly and see, look, we're on the red card side. Okay, so then what do we need to do? And one of the things that's evolved with this team is that we'll drop back and ask, could my 16-year-old son, Reese, or Kim's one of our team members, could her son Deontay come in and see that, yes, we were on the green card, either we met the standard or we didn't. So these two have no, no background in healthcare at all. But if we're doing well, they should be able to see, yeah, you're hitting what you said you were or not. So ultimately what the team came up with was that if any, on my side as part of the team, if I get more than five bolded messages in any of the sub spaces within my in basket, so if I get six of them sitting in patient calls or in any other area, that's a signal that I should either ask for help or let people know that I don't help because it, it's just mounted to this. Alternatively, if Oscar's part of the team and I see that Oscar's in basket has more than five bolded in any place, I'm, um, I'm going, somebody is going to Oscar and ask him. And so as that unfolded, Mark Rosenthal was, I was talking to him and Mark had suggested using the experimenting record. So we said, this is what we're trying to do. 
what we're trying to do is make objective what the what's occurring. When do people raise their hand or when do people offer to help? Here's what we think will happen as we're running this experiment with the five bolded. And then Alyssa took this over and Alyssa on our team started asking what's coming from this. And I think like Mike had described, the team is just leaning into it. They're, they're learning, they're growing and they're, they're now helping each other. And also it's gotten them much more efficient in their own work. As we so play the, on the objective side. So the standard input from the previous slide that Mike was talking about, the standard input that was missing and creating red poster situation was at what point do I yell out because I'm overfaced? That's the standard. It was as simple as that. Exactly. If we if we all have a green card understanding of what point I yell out because I'm overfaced you were able to transition from a messy situation to a to a less messy situation. That's, that was the standard input, yeah? Exactly. And additionally, there were just a lot of other learnings, deeper learnings that came out of that, that evolved. Yeah. And, and your Blue. point is... Oh, go, Mike. Go, Mike. Well, I was going to ask a quick question. One of my observations is that this is most powerful when teams are defining this themselves and among themselves and because they are they are in essence figuring out who to overcome making do and it is one of the one of the, the one of the things that can be a minor frustration a, a, a very minor is that if you take what you guys came up with what your team came up with take that to a different team and give that to them, they may well see this as sort of an edict from on high, as opposed to having been involved in the process of working through these. So even when you have come up with a green card, I would encourage people to facilitate that in such a way that it is open for discussion and improvements or whatever, so people have ownership in that green card. Yeah, I think what we're saying here, what we're learning here is if you tell people we're going to write, we're going to do standardised work for this, people sort of switch off a bit. That's the reality. If we present it right. as red card, green card, it's a concept that people can get their heads around and they can recognise pretty much instantly. That's certainly my experience. Is that what you feel, Mike and Lou? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, you, I, I think... Know you had to, I think the terms like normal and I think the terms normal and abnormal just bring it down to everybody's language. Yeah, yeah. You've got some further thoughts on that. I know in this gap, how you bridge this gap, Mike. You mean how how do how do we how do we do that or how do we facilitate it? Yeah, how do you how we facilitate? How do we do it? your experience with it, you've seen, I know you've you've got some pretty robust thoughts on your experience in seeing people close this gap between red and green card. Well, when where, where we've seen it, uh, they're, they're, I know I've shared this with you, Oscar, but, but Elliot Goldratt in his book, Theory of Constraints, there's a very powerful statement in there where he said the only resist, the only power that will overcome resistance to change is the power of the discoverer. And when when you have, like in Lou's case, where his team, where they are discovering what they want to define normal as, there is tremendous energy around that. And they take ownership in that and you don't even have to it isn't like you have to do it in an edict. They take it on themselves and, and run with it. Is that fair, Lou? Absolutely. Yeah, what, what I've seen, and, one, and you both, may both want to comment on this, what I've seen is that this concept of red and green creates conversations, and it creates the right conversations amongst the right people. It's a concept yes. they can easily understand, and that triggers the, the, the it triggers some really really good conversation. That's right. Very yeah. very easily. Mike, one of the things, Mike, one of the things you said at that dinner that it's coming back to me now is that 
regardless of your education level, if you can read, you can get this. At least that's my recollection of right. you don't have to have, you know, when we talk about the other, in, like, do you remember the different ways? You There were five ways that you said this was, they would talk about, how, what were or other ways that they described this? What are we describing here? Because I remember you listing them off. We used this, 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 this. People didn't get it, but they get this. Well, I mean, I could list a lot more than five that people haven't gotten. But the, I mean, the, the magic, the, I think the magic is in, first of all, saying we want to define what is normal because that is different when you say what that we want to define what is normal is very different than let me tell you what you should be doing and uh, exactly. secondly the way the, I've watched Oscar facilitate this is you start with what the output has to be for example that weld in the upper right hand picture if that is a, an acceptable weld or is not an acceptable weld that you, you have to define what that is. And some of that has to do with the, with the bead and all of those other kinds of things. But once you've defined what the output is to, supposed to look like, then you start defining what the rod is that that, that, that welder is using and, the, and the, his activity that he has to perform and what the equipment has to perform and so on. And, but once you've defined what the output of any process is, then you can begin to define what the what the nature of the process has to be. That is, what are the steps in the process? What are the involvement with people? And all of that, all of that brings out conversations that get people engaged. And there is this like there's there's it's like there's just been this lid lifted off of their life where all of a sudden they feel like they have some ability to have input into how they do their work, and that is unbelievably energizing. Uh, thanks, Mike. Look, we've got three minutes left. So just what, a question from uh, Mark Galloway submitted a question when he registered. Uh, and I'd like but one or both of you to comment, please. He said, how do we coach our teams to wait for all inputs when they spend their entire day taking action? How do we coach our teams to wait for all inputs when they spend their entire day taking action? What's your thoughts on that question? Either one of you. I would suggest that you start planning to take a few time, a few minutes in the beginning of the day and a few minutes at the end of the day and stop taking action and start thinking because you can you can have you be head down and butt up all day long and not get anywhere close to solving these kinds of issues. It requires time set aside. I think Mike Rother describes it as striving on a daily basis to take the time to define what the issues are, what needs to be improved, and how you can go forward. Now, that's just to begin to get the conversation going. Getting yeah. this going, may, I don't know, uh, Lou, what, how much time that took, but my suspicion is whatever time it took was one of the best investments you've made. Absolutely. Uh, and, and also what I liked about Lou's example was he, chose, he didn't chose something this big. He chose something this big to demonstrate a concept if you like so i think that's important as well if you try if you, that's right if you are uh, if you start on something this big it's going to fail not because of the pro not because the concept's bad but because the it, you bite off too big a chunk so you've that's got right. to apply these concepts to something really small and see what you learn and i think going back to what mike had brought up i i didn't choose it the team had already yeah. was a problem they had identified it was their you know, I was just there with the red card, green card at the right time. Um, but it was that a problem they were already seeing. So they were the experts on this and, and they took it and ran with it. It's yeah. just the, the red card, green card unleashed all this energy. All right. So we've come to the end. I had a couple of backup slides. Uh, let me just go to the last slide. Now, what we want you to do, please, those... Um, the reason you wrote something down at the start is because we would like you to try using the red card, green card concept to create a conversation. 
<clears throat> that might help your issue. So please try using the red card, green card concept to create a conversation that might help your issue. If you try this or when you try it, please could you let Lou, Mike and myself know two things. How did you introduce it? Because this is what we're, we're most interested in, how people introduce this concept. How did you inter introduce it and what worked and what didn't work? So if you do try it, I would really love you or when you love you to do it, when you try it, introduce this concept, let Lou or Lou, Mike and myself know how do you introduce it and what worked and what didn't work. Now, as soon as this presentation's over, I'm going to email or this webinar's over, I'll email the slides set to, um, to Skylar and ask her to forward it out so you have those email addresses. So thank you very much. We've got a minute over. Thanks very much. And just a reminder that Lou and uh, Mike and myself will be at the TWI Summit Cardicon in Indiana in April, and you're welcome to pick uh, Mike and Lou's brains further. Mike and Lou, thank you very much for the, having the conversation with us. And thank you. Thank you, invitation. Thank you, Skyler. Yep. Thank you all. Just a quick reminder, you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. And just like Oscar said, you are more than welcome to join us at the TWI and Kata Summit. Thank you all again. We will see you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks Bye -bye. a lot. Thanks, guys. Bye.